Yes, uh, the, the Incans, we think, might be less key, but the Muscovy Duck. And so these are, and, and that's a, there's only four domesticated waterfowl. And so these top three geese are, are probably from the great, and this is the Chinese goose that tend to have that knob. But again, all these different kinds of geese, you look at them, they're all, they often breed with each other, um, and they're, they're different breeds of geese. These are all mallards. <laughs> and if you ever get a mallard book, it's just like a dog book. There's like 40 kinds of mallards. <laughs> it's just, it's a stunning. And, and, you know, they go from these runner ducks to the big fat meat ducks to poop, poopy headed ducks. And that little one's called the coal duck because they're so noisy they used to be in the country. What's this? Ass whack. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a pair of mallards. That's the male on the right or the female on the left. And, and of course, he's a peacock. <laughs> but, but they can breathe freely and. Um, there are a couple. What happened? Why did they hide? Um, no, she's, she's just uh, kind of a, a regular domestic dog. Yeah. He's a little she sold her. Yeah, I know, but what are they based on? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we think about dogs. You know, we cross all different breeds yeah. of dogs and we have to learn to do that. Is there any, is it true that when the Moscow weed ducks breed with a domestic duck, they produce their way? Or a sterile mule, a so. mule yeah. out of the offspring, and yeah. the mule was sterile? Yeah, so muscovies could breed with mallards. They're not even the same tribe. They're not even the same genus or tribe. It's a subgroup. Sub um, and I think their babies are sterile, but the fact that they can breed, they're so not closely related. Just amazing. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if that was a true or a white thing. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I haven't tracked that down either. <laughs> So here's our muscogees in different versions, and this one on the lower left has probably got a mallard in it. So not only we eat them and enjoy them that way, um, but we've used them as guards. And this this bird on the bottom is, is a screamer. Does that look like a waterfowl to you? No. Right feet web. Does it have a duck like tail? Well, it's South American, and the South Americans would have these. They, they're called screamers because they're so noisy. And they would have them in their villages, and that would, if anybody came by, they would all raise a wagon to do their safety. But, um, and they're, they're still put in the close relatives of the waterfowl group. I, I had to check the taxonomy because I'll tell you the characteristics of waterfowl, and for every single characteristic I tell you, someone does it different. <laughs> and here's the example. So, and, and so back in 390 BC, uh, in, in the city of Rome, there's a, a, apparently one of the, the hills of Rome was Tacony. And the gulls were attacking, and they were defending their city with a lot of cliff. And so they just defend the plains. And so anyway, the gulls are like, okay, we'll climb up that cliff, and we'll attack them in the middle of the night. And the geese um, heard them coming up the back of the cliff, and they all started making noise, and everybody ran out, and they, they defeated the gulls. And so they still have a celebration to, to celebrate um, the city being saved from the gulls by <laughs> geese. <laughs> <laughs> and so also um, in Scotland, they, they have them around whiskey distilleries, the screamers, I talked about them, and barnyards across the country. And if you've ever been around geese, they make a racket whenever you come around. Um, Emperor Frederick II wrote this art of falconry back in 1248. It is astonishingly sophisticated. And one of the things that he knew, and you notice there's pictures of waterfowl stuff, he knew what kind of waterfowl were around, whether they were in marshes or whether they were in bays. He knew what time of year they showed up. He knew how to hunt them. Um, it's just really amazing that back in 1200, we, we had a very sophisticated falconry and, and waterfowl hunting. Paul, do we know where Frederick was from? Which I think he was German or Prussian. Mm -hmm. Middle European. <coughs> and we use their feathers. Um, you know, there's a comforter right there, geese down. Uh, eiders have the very best down, but then they also have, geese and ducks have, have down. And when I worked on National Wildlife Refuge in Missouri, you could go to a restaurant, they'd pluck your bird, and they'd take all the down out of it, and they'd sell that as an uh, extra product. And you'd eat lunch and go out and get your clean goose, and they'd head you down. <laughs> and so, of course, uh, Americans are obsessed with our guns, and these are various uh, old guns. This top gun's flintlock. 
um, like John James Audubon used to shoot. Um, this is a double barrel, and it's, it's, it breaks in the middle and it actually has shells. This is like 1870 when we started getting better guns. This is just a little flow bear. That's, that's a parlor shooting gun, and that's when they shot uh, Wade Bird Rookery down because it was so small and quiet. And then the bottom one is just a portable pocket pistol. But anyway, so once we invented gunpowder uh, and all that, in America, waterfowling really took off. Jeez. And then we had really big guns. <laughs> and so it's one thing to hunt birds for your family. You know, you shoot two or three of them, you go home and eat. Um, but if you're hunting to sell in the market, and America has a long history of that, um, you, you use these big guns. And so they would go out in, at the night, and they'd have that gun mounted on the boats and fire it off when they'd flush the flocks, and you could kill 100 birds in one shot, and you'd collect them all up and take them to the market. But of course, when you do that, that really starts depressing populations of wild animals. Yeah. And here's another kind of gun that fires a succession of shots, bam, 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 bam. So anyway, these guys are devising all the kinds of stuff. And so, you know, this was back in an age when the bison were disappearing, yeah. the passenger pigeons were disappearing. We were starting, you know, we'd already shot out here, turkeys around the New England cities, they just weren't there anymore. And so America was waking up to, you can't just shoot everything all the time. Um, we've got to have some restraint. So the guns to just to flush them? No. Oh. Um, yeah, usually, usually what you want to do is flush them because if they're in the water, they're very hard to kill. They're still like an iceberg, most of their body is up in the air. But once they get up in the air, they're very vulnerable. So well, these things would be better shot, but uh, there wouldn't be much meat left after you shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if they're too close, and that's what they would do is they'd go out at night, they'd go into the flock, and once they flush, that time they'd burn out. And this was real dangerous work too, because that's a little stiff, and when you're out in the ocean in cold weather, and, yeah. and some of those big punt guns can actually break your boat and then you sink it. But I think for a bike. Yeah. So part of that harvest um, led <coughs> to some of our earliest bird protection. You know, we're Audubon, we know about protecting the food birds and stuff. But they started passing different kinds of laws to try to protect different kinds of useful birds. And really the law that really kicked in was the Audubon model law. And this was a law, when we first would make laws for pet birds, we said, you can't shoot cardinals. And then someone would go out and shoot a cardinal, and you'd say, okay, you're under arrest. They said, I did, I shot a red bird, I, I didn't shoot a cardinal. <laughs> so yeah, all these common names. And so what these guys finally realized, um, and, and these are the guys that kind of did it. Frank Chapman, he's the guy that started the Christmas Bird Cat and worked in the American Museum of Natural History. And the ornithologists finally realized, look, there's only a certain groups of birds that we really hunt. It's the waterfowl group and the grouses and, and turkeys and, and stuff. So we're just going to say, okay, here's a list of things you can hunt. And this is all. If it's not on this list, you cannot shoot. And that's the way our laws are made right now. And so Chapman helped draft that law. Um, Pearson and the Ottawa Society went to state to state to try to get the states to pass this model bird law to try to protect birds. This is right around 1900. And what really amazed me is how could you go to Florida and you're, you know, you just show up and you say, hey, I want you guys to pass a law to tell all your people to quit shooting stuff. And I, I just couldn't imagine how he could show up and get the Florida legislature to pass that. And then in his, in his memoir, he's like, then I went to North Carolina, they passed it, I went to Virginia, then I went to, and I'm like, how? That just doesn't seem impossible. But what he forgot to mention, <laughs> women. <laughs> Um, back in 1900, Claire Dotler started the Florida Audubon Society. She lived up on Dotler's Drive in what's now Orlando. And she was uh, married to a very wealthy industrialist, agricultural guy. Teddy Roosevelt was on her board. Um, the wife of the governor of the state was on her board. Um, the president of, of Rollins College was on her board. I mean, you read her board, who's who. And, and it was really the women that assembled everything, but the men had to hold positions. And so Pearson just forgot to talk about it. But really, you know, when they arrived in Florida to say we want to pass this law, the deal's done. <laughs> the men had already been told they're going to they're going to do it. So this is this is an important <coughs> part of the Alabama. And so the only North American duck we think we've lost is is Labrador duck. And Todd McGrain did this this lost bird project, and he made five statues of extinct birds, and he went and put the statues in the last spot that they were seen. And so the Labrador duck, the last one shot was in uh, New York State. So this, this statue stands in New York. And, and part of his motto for Lost Bird is, because forgetting is a second extinction. Mm -hmm. If we forget they're gone, they're extinct. 
And so he also did um, uh, a heat hen on Martha's Vineyard. He's got a great hawk on um, somewhere up in New Brunswick out on, on the Aleutian Islands. Um, the Carolina parakeet is at the Kissimmee Bird Preserve State Park if you want to go out there and see that. And what was the other one? Passenger pigeon, right. Thank you, commissioner. And, and actually, he got commissioned to do a sixth bird in Eskimo Clear when he lives in Texas. And he has a traveling exhibit that goes through Florida periodically. And he has um, a, identical statues to this, and they'll all be in one spot if you ever hear about the lost bird find there. OK, so you know we're passing laws to try to save ducks. Um, Dean Darling was a very, um, he got, he was very connected. And he was a cartoonist. and, and Franklin Roosevelt made the head of his Department of Interior Biological Survey, or what it was called back then. And he started the duck stand. And he said, if people are going to hunt, um, that the, we're all going to pay a, a stamp and we're going to protect the duck from that. And so this is one of his, his, his part, you know, political cartoons where, you know, here it was in the good old days and here it is now. Everybody is hunting and shooting and <laughs> there's just too many people blasting away at birds. And so he, he started the duck stamp. There's an entire books about it. Here's another similar cartoon, you know, why it seems about time to begin to talk of conservation. And so there was, not only we were passing laws to protect waterfowl and other birds, but we were also trying to buy land and make refuges for them. And there are also people trying to figure out how we breed them. And so here's, you know, Ducks Unlimited, we all know about them. Um, this was done in 1915, um, how to raise waterfowl and more waterfowl. And so people were trying to say, how can we protect waterfowl? And as it turns out, trying to breed waterfowl to maintain a continental populace just doesn't work. And meanwhile, all this was done because everybody likes shooting. <laughs> um, these are decoys, obviously, of, of different styles and different kinds. So there's a whole technology in, around duck hunting. And so here's a little duck boat. This is called a layout boat. You can go out in the middle of the bay and lay in that, and the ducks don't notice you. This is called a sink box. And all those canvas back decoys around the sink box, what are they made out of? Lead. Lead. Lead, yeah, the sink oh. box down in the water. Oh. Oh. And and so these got out of because they were so yeah. effective that the birds wouldn't see them when they came in. Um, and they also were very dangerous. And obviously, he doesn't have a boat there. He had to have a tender who would come pick him up. But these things would sink too. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. I don't think that would be very comfortable. And decoys now are considered art. Um, million dollars for a decoy. And, and Elmer Kroll was very, very famous because he did these very detailed ones. This was actually a working decoy, although no one worked with it very much. But if you threw it out there in the water, it would decoy birds in. And there were books written about how to paint decoys. And this is Joan Barber's decoy book. And notice Roger Tory Peterson's first field guide. The, the imitations of, of the decoys and Tory Peterson's Roger Tory Peterson, when he made his first field guide back in the 1930s, he didn't paint the birds exactly. He painted them as you would see them from 50 yards. So just general color patterns. And that's also what goes on with decoys. And you know, now we have Sibley's book, and it's very, very detailed. We have really good optics, and everybody can see. But back when, when Peterson was doing it, he's like, this is what they look like from a distance. But it's the same thing in decoy painting. home and there's an old guy and he's been a commercial fisherman on the Missouri River and he also hunted ducks and he had collars. We used to hunt with live ducks. You put that little collar on, it's just like a dog collar, but it's duck size. You put it around your neck, you put a weight on your foot or, or on the collar, you throw it out in the water, and they swim around, they call it the wild ducks. And this has also been outlawed because it's too effective. But Fancy told me he had some collars and I'm like, you have duck collars? He's like, yeah. And I went and looked and they're just like dog collars, but he gave me three of them. So. So duck technology. Okay, so um, there's even dogs that are bred to be duck hunters. And um, this is my old dog, Coot. Um, and Labrador Retrievers were the number one breed of dogs in people's homes for 31 years straight. And just last year, they got pets. Why? French Bulldogs. <coughs> Because I was looking it up to try to find out how long they did number one, and it says they've lost number one. <coughs> really? 
But I guess the French Bulldog is a smaller dog than we have at the Durban Center. But anyway, the labs are still really popular. So this is my old dog. Oh. He's not that cute anymore, but this is my new dog. <laughs> and so did anybody see Duck Dynasty or hear about it? <laughs> yeah, about these cra crazy cages that, that made all their money selling duck hunting decoys and stuff and calls. This is Uncle Cy. And you almost have to have a translator when you listen to him talk on the show because he's such a Cajun. But look what he's saying. That's a poodle. Yeah, it's a poodle. <laughs> Poodles are duck dogs. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, so everybody would make fun of him. And he's he like, no, I got a great poodle. It's a great duck dog. So there's a lot of dogs, um, you know, golden retrievers, and there's flat coat retrievers, and there's Newfoundlands and other things. John James Audubon had a Newfoundland to hunt, hunt for. <laughs> This is, I've never seen one of these guys, but these little dogs, they're called toy retrievers, and they run down to the edge of the water, they jump around, and they do antics, and the ducks actually swim in to look at them. <laughs> and, yeah, and so they've used to, these to, to lure the ducks close enough to shoot at them from shore, and they've also used them when they're banding ducks, they get their thing to, to dance around, and the ducks will follow the, the dog through a trap. <coughs> so, yeah, and, and no one really seems to know exactly why Ducks come to look at this stupid little dog, but anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, and, you, and there's some, if you get on the internet, you can Google it up and you'll see them dancing around the water and they're way laughing. So, you know, we even have entire breeds of dogs that were made just to hunt waterfowl. And of course, you know, we like them in our parks. Some people do. <laughs> so you get too many of them, they poop all over everything. But, you know, again, we, we derive a lot of enjoyment. And one thing I remembered is a far side joke. And the, the biology of the, the, the waterfowl tribe or their group are called Anatidae, that's their, their family. And this is on Gary Larson, the fear that somewhere, <laughs> somehow, a duck is watching you. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I wonder if that's real. I wonder if somebody had that picture. So I Googled it and I immediately got hits on it. I'm like, it's real. But all they show you is this joke. So, <laughs> so yeah, maybe, maybe someone has this, but um, anyway. And again, um, nest boxes. Yeah, we put them out for bluebirds and we put them out for ducks. Um, in Missouri, they used to put out tubs for giant panda geese until they got so abundant everybody was mad. Um, but it worked really well, and, and they'll use these tubs and they hop out with their babies and now off they go. So again, us enjoying birds in our yard. This is, what, what kind of duck is this? Black belly yeah. whistling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is it? Black, 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 black belly whistling duck. Mm -hmm. And when, when I took this picture, this was when I was still at Texas Tech, and one of my friends was working on these guys down in, in the, the lower, uh, near Corpus Christi. And no further into the United States, black belly whistling ducks came in at that time, because they're more of a tropical duck. And of course, now they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, they spread all along the Gulf Rim, they're clear on our eyes. And so, anyway, again, another duck that we can get nesting in our boxes. Mm -hmm. And waterfowl are also part of art. And this is as much a landscape painting as it is a, a bird painting. And so there's been an awful lot of art about waterfowl. This is Francis Jackley's Golden Twilight. He and his wife were out canoeing one night and this image stuck in his mind. He painted this. He was a famous painter. And this one hung on his mantle at his house. And Fuertes, another famous bird artist, you know, we just, birds and, and art and ducks inspire us. And then Gerald Thayer was a very successful artist back at the turn of the century. And he actually funded a lot of stuff. But he was also on the, of the bent that wood ducks were not gaudy, they were camouflage. They live in a light dappled environment in forests and stuff like that. So he drew these paintings to show, you know, they don't show up that well. They're, they're pretty concealed. He even has one of them, <coughs> Peacock, that if you use your imagination, it's pretty well concealed. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's um, artwork. This is in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, this is the spirit of Nebraska's wilderness, and they have other statues of bison and wagon trains and stuff like that. But this is in, you know, downtown Omaha. And then, of course, decoys. They go from a working decoy to a very, very deep 
detailed sculpture to just silence. Um, Paul, can I ask you a question about the toys while you're here? Yeah. So you showed us that one from, uh, it was in Nevada or yeah. somewhere pre-Columbian time. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea of where the first decoys uh, originated? I mean, which culture <laughs> or what time period were the first? Of the That's years? the oldest decoy in the Americas. Um, the Egyptians may have used them you know, when they were setting those traps and stuff, but yeah. I don't know if I think right now. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, as, as gregarious as they are, you know, I guess I could go read Frederick the Great's Falcon book. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it makes sense because they're always in groups. will be miles long, they'll go by it for miles, and they're just a big patchwork of bees. Um, and just, and when they get up, it's just deafening, it's just, and so as a kid, you know, when we went up there, and we went hunting and stuff, and it just, you know, it just makes an impact on you when you see stuff like this. It's really something. Okay, so that's just kind of, you know, there's just all kinds of ways we've connected with them, for food, and for clothing, and for fun, and for inspiration and you know all that kind of stuff um and so the waterfowl family there's only about 170 species of waterfowl in the whole world <coughs> and north america has about 60 so we have like one third of all the waterfowl species in the world which you know we always hear about columbia having 10,000 birds or whatever <laughs> you know but but when it comes to waterfowl north america is very very rich in waterfowl um Florida has 42 species that we've recorded here. Um, 30 species are common, and then you get some of the sea ducks that will come down and every now and then, and they'll be off the coast or whatever. So we've got one third of all the waterfowl in, in the world. So what is a waterfowl? Well, they got their flat bills, and they got the little melody around it, you know, for straining or, or cutting grass. Um, they got long necks, uh, you know, especially swans. They have pointed wings. And, and they're very high speed flyers, except when you see black belly whistling ducks are around it, but most of them have long pointed wings and they're very good at flying long distances. Um, wet feet, <coughs> scaled legs. Um, oh yeah, that flattened body. So why would they all be flat like that? They're a little boat, they got a boat. Yeah. So it makes sense to be wide. And that's part of the reason they waddle so much is their feet are so far apart. You know, you lift up your foot and you're like, oh. <laughs> so, so that's very much a part of it. They walk. I mentioned the down. If, if you take their breast feathers and pull them up, you'll see a, a layer of down in there. And you know, they line their nest with it, and it also insulates them, especially during the winter. And so they've got two layers of feathers, you know, an under layer and an upper layer. Um, simultaneous wing roll. When you live in the water, you know how raptors fly around, they've got one flight feather missing, one of the feathers, <coughs> and another one, and another one. They drop them one at a time so they can keep flying. Ducks drop all their flight feathers at once, and they fly this way. Oh. Yeah, and they do this because they live in the water and they can go hide in the weeds for a month. And so they regrow all their feathers at once. And like it's seasonal? I mean, like in the spring? Yeah, if they act in the breeding season and all get to that point, but uh, they won't fly in the summer. Only once a year? Pardon? Only once a year, not twice a year? Yeah, once a year. Oh. Yeah, so every year they replace all their feathers. <coughs> and they do it all at the same time. <coughs> and then precocial down the young. And we'll talk about why that's important. Um, 
But after they hatch out of the nest, uh, all the eggs hatch simultaneously. So when she lays her nest, she lays one egg a day. I'm getting ahead of myself, but and she'll do it for about two weeks, and she'll get like 10 to 12 eggs. And then she starts sitting on them, and they all start developing at the same time. Because eggs are like seeds, you know, that you put a seed in the drawer, it'll sit there until you water it. And then once you water it, it'll start growing. And so that way, they all hatch out at the same time. Even though one was laid two weeks before the other one, they all hatch at the same time, so they all the same time. And, then, and that way, everybody can leave together. Which works pretty well, but sometimes people get left. Okay, so these are some of the common ducks in Florida. I put a little star because they're really common. The other ones are here almost every year, but not necessarily common. Do you guys see full dismissing ducks at SDA 5 plot? Yes. Uh, okay. uh, well, I would say less and less. But we still see, really? Yeah, less, up, up through last year, we were still seeing them. Yeah. yeah. So both the fullest and the black belly are recent invaders. Yeah. Fullest was like ducks follow rice. They just love rice culture. Mm -hmm. And so they have populations that are separated in Africa on the east and west side. They're in South America. They're here in North America. They're just some of them in Asia. Um, wherever you plant rice, they show up. When we planted rice in the DNA, they show up. And then, of course, the black belly has, has expanded into the state. Um, and then we have some exotics, you know, the mallard and, and the muscogee. Are there any the muscogee out there? Yeah, the muscogee the muscogee's out there. And, and then some of them are answered. So these are some of the more common birds you can see in, in Florida. And again, you know, this is about 25 birds. This is one out of six butterfly species in the world. So again, we have a pretty good diversity in this group. Paul, why do you have the question mark after sea ducks? Because I don't know much about them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, they, you know, scoters and igers, they were seen here in Florida every year. Um, but you've got to like, go to Tampa Bay or Merritt Island and play with your scope for an hour and you'll see one bobbing around out there. I don't, if I lived on the coast, I'd have a better idea how, how regular they are. Really. So. so one time I was on Lake Okeechobee and some water ran the district people said, yeah, it's a real weird goose down there, you know? And you ought to go look at it. And I'm like, well, whatever. And I figured it was a muscogee or something. I get down there, this is a ruddy shell duck in Europe. Um, it was a pair, they weren't banded, so I don't know if they got away from some of the collection. But that's, you know, what the waterfowl do, they've got those long pointed wings, they fly really strongly, they can go a long way, so this guy could have been from, from Asia. We don't really have that many breeders down here. Um, the two whistling ducks are new. Um, so Florida's more of a wintering and a migratory state for, for waterfowl than it is a breeding state. Um, and that's because we're so far south. And in North America, we have this area called the Pine Pothole region, and this is one of the biggest duck factories in the world. Um, the Everglades may have had more nesting and breeding birds than anywhere in the world. This place probably has a, a more waterfowl nesting than anywhere else in the world. Um, and then you can see all these lines that, that they fly south. They get a scoff that'll fly all the way from Alaska, or say down here in Florida. Um, some of them go to the Caribbean, but most of the waterfowl stay along, stay in, in the U.S. and they don't go all the way across the ocean. And here's, this is just, I just Googled this up. This is North Dakota. These are called the prairie hawks. <clears throat> and so you can tell there's tons of wetlands. And so um, in the summer, all these waterfowl fly up there and, and, and breed, and, and there's a lot of opportunity for them. And so if you look at North American waterfowl, they're pretty colorful. Um, and part of the reason we think we have so many really beautiful ducks, because you go to some places, well, like Florida, we have a model duck, what color is it? Right? But we think up on the prairie poppies, there's so many different species of closely related birds breeding together that they have to really be distinct things to prevent hybridization. And so that gives us not only a whole bunch of different kinds of ducks, but it also gives us really beautiful ducks because they're all differentiated from ducks. And so you can take the waterfowl and break them into two distinct groups. One are the swans and geese and whistling ducks, and then the others are the more traditional ducks. And the difference between the swans mate for life and ducks mate seasonally, um, you know, like the mallard, the, the male and female pair on the winter grounds and breeding grounds, they don't stay together their whole life. Um, and the parents both, uh, in the 
ducks, geese, and swans, they both take care of the babies. You saw that picture of Canada geese, and both, mm -hmm. both care for their, with the ducks. Usually, the, as soon as the female gets on the nest and she starts incubating, the guy takes off. And she's on her own the next time. So, um, of course, they have longer necks than ducks. Ducks have shorter mm -hmm. necks. Um, they have a simple voice box in swans and geese. If you hear a, a male goose honk and a female goose honk, it sounds the same. But if you look at ducks, like if you hear a mallard duck, he goes, Bleh. and the female goes, Bleh, 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 Bleh. so their voices mm -hmm. are different. Um, and also their plumages. The male and female look the same, and ducks, the males, are, are generally more colorful. And the geese have one annual body molt. They molt all their feathers and all their flight feathers once. And the ducks will molt their body feathers two or three times. They only molt their wing feathers once. But so the ducks, you know, they, they just have a lot of differences from, from the geese and the whistling ducks. So that's why whistling ducks are in with the geese. And we call them whistling ducks because they're really whistling goose things. <laughs> <laughs> so what are these guys doing? Oh, wow. <laughs> they tell <them> jokes? <laughs> this is courtship. Um, the ducks especially have really fun courtship. <coughs> you can catch them in the litter and watch them. They just carry on. And here's the girl playing cool, you know, the boys trying to show off and say, hey, look at me. Um, and so the courtship of waterfowl is just really something that if you ever get, get to see them doing it, it's really fun to watch. And these are dabbling ducks. They have their own kind of courtship. This little green wing teal is oh, doing wow. the head up, tail up. And you notice this mallard's in the process of doing a head up, tail up. And this is the grunt whistle. Well, here it is. And what he does is he leans forward and he pulls his head back up and he goes, mm. <laughs> and it's called the grunt whistle. And so anyway, they have these ritualized um, breeding things um, that they do to try to impress the girls and, and try to get a mate. This is the ruddy duck. These are weird little ducks. Wow. Um, the only one in North America is this one. Up here, he's doing his bubbles. They, he pops the water and makes bubbles. Blah, 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 blah. And then this is called the ringing rush. And he'll run across the water and pop his wings on the water and go pop, 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 right across the pond. So even when you're near a pond, you know them. You don't even have to see them. You know they're there when you hear that ringing rush. So anyway, the courtship of waterfowl is just really and you know, they're doing it out in the water. It's not like a songbird in the forest singing and you can hear them and it's lovely, but you know, they're doing this right in full sight. Does he just look extremely tiny because of the picture? Pardon? Does he just look extremely tiny because of the picture or are they small ducks? Um, yeah, they're only about this big. They're, they're pretty small. <laughs> and one thing about them, when I talk about anyway, the female, the ruddy ducks get up to the, the breeding grass later than almost anybody, and they only lay about five eggs or six eggs, and um, most ducks will lay 10 to 12, and their their eggs weigh 20% of the female's weight. And she lays that much about a week, and her clutch will sometimes weigh more than she does. And when that baby comes out, they've got a late start, but it's a little geared up baby. He's, <laughs> he's, he's ready to go. <laughs> so that's the, the ruddy duck doesn't lay as many eggs, but they have great big eggs and great big there's even a kind of ruddy duck down in South America, and they lay their eggs in other ducks' nests. They're a nest predator or a parasite. And that little baby duck, what happens, it just leaves and raises itself. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't even wait for the parents. Okay, so this is a real common type of picture you'll see of ducks on living. What is the sex ratio of this picture? Yeah, exactly. So why is this happening? First, you know, they're moving to you can tell by the bright feathers. So this is the springtime. What's going on? Well, so since the female duck sits on the nest, she gets she has more predation. And there's never enough girls around to the boys. So this is a flock of ducks, and there's too many boys, and there's only one girl, and they're chasing her. And um, these fights can, can be pretty bad. I mean, sometimes they'll knock her down and, and even grab her. Um, <coughs> And she's probably, her mate's probably in there, and he's trying to defend her. Um, but uh, this is one of the things ducks do, and people get mortified when they go watch what's going on, because this is just part of how they do it. Most of them get paired, and they, they stay seasonal in the office. But all these extra males are under the doors. Do hunting regulations address this? Mm -hmm. Certain species are supposed to go after the male male? Yeah, in the mallard duck, they've done that. Um, you can shoot 100 points worth of ducks. And the male mallard is 25 points, so if you shoot them, you can shoot four of them. 
but the female has been 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you really should have the females. And so that tries to give it 100 to shoot the males and not the females. Mm -hmm. Now how successful that is is kind of questionable because um, most hunters can't. <laughs> yeah, they don't even know what they're shooting at. <laughs> for, for experienced hunters, you, that's, it's good because you can just shoot the males. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so here's the nest of the model duck. And there's four, eight, okay, ten eggs in here. Now, <clears throat> these eggs weigh about 50 grams, and she weighs 1,000 grams. And so you put 10 eggs at 50 grams, that's 500 grams of eggs. That's half her body weight. And she lays it in about 12 days. So how could she put out half her body weight? And what the, what ducks can do, and they're, they're just so much more physiologically capable than we are, um, they get really fat before they breed. And the male gets fat so he can defend his female and defend his territory. And the female gets fat so she can lay eggs. And what she does is when she's egg laying, she goes out and eats as many bugs and, and snails to get the calcium for their shell and have all the food she can do. It's called hyperphagia. Her liver gets bigger, her intestines get bigger, her kidneys get bigger, um, and, and you know, this is like digestive like stuff that it's got to, and her intestines get longer. Um, and so that way she can process a lot of food because she lives off her fat. And so when she starts laying, she'll weigh 1,000 grams. 12 days later, she'll put me down around 800. Mm -hmm. And she uses that fat to finance putting that energy in the egg. The problem then is she's had to sit in the nest and incubate for about three weeks, or mm -hmm. almost four weeks. And so then by the time she gets her, her ducklings to hatch, she may be down to 750 grams. Yeah, well, lost it. But, but what happens is, remember they're precocial? So at this stage, these little guys are swimming around here feeding themselves. And she can go with them, she can feed herself and try to build her reserves. But she really makes big sacrifices to be able to support this group. <laughs> and, the wild duck's also called the Florida duck, and one of my friends drew this for me when I was up at school. That's the duck version of Florida man? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. She's got a boom box, drink. <laughs> and a palm tree. <laughs> okay, so I told you about the, the, the wing bowl, and here's a picture of the wing when it's, it's regrowing. And this takes about four weeks. Um, when they do this, this is after they breed, and what do they do? They go get fat. And then when they're stuck on a pond for a month and they can't get out of there, they've got enough reserve to make it for a month in case their pond is not as productive as they want or whatever. And so they, they regrow their wings, they lose weight, and then after they do that, then it's time to migrate, so they have to put on fat again. Birds are just amazing physiologically. And so this is a pond um, out of the prairies um, in Oak County, and these are all holes of ducks. And they just kind of hang out the weeds and swim around, and you know, when you're aquatic, you can do this. Uh, grebes do this, and um, some other birds. And so that's their annual cycle. You know, they breed in the spring, they get real fat, spend a lot of energy, they raise their young, um, then they go for a molt, and they do that, and then they migrate. And you know, when they migrate south, they get fat, when they migrate back north, they get fat. We've even done some correlations where if you live in wet weather conditions in the winter, if it's really wet, it's really good, the subsequent breeding season is better. And it's a drought, the subsequent breeding season is worse because they're keeping it bad enough to fly back north and fly and get in their shape to do all this hard work and breeding. So it's important for us, even in the south, to maintain their habitat because they have a whole life cycle to try to make that good environment. And so, um, wrap up here. Uh, waterfowl can be used for conservation. And this little chickadee is removing a people sack from a nest on top of a waterfowl refuge. Um, when we save these weapons, we save them the habitat for a lot of things. And so waterfowl have also been kind of a, an umbrella species to help us save things. And save weapons. You know, there's a big, in America, we have a pretty good weapon protection program. It's not as good as it should be, but if you look at uplands like scrub and, and long leaf pine, we don't protect them like we do weapons. And we've actually restored them. And so, I'm, I have a question about yeah. the weapons. Yeah. And it was a splinter system for the weapons. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
increasing since they said we signed a migratory bird treaty act with Canada and it said while well, your birds are in the United States, we're going to protect them. And so every wetland that they're using we need to protect. And so that was one of the protections and that got finally struck down. But then the other one was waters of the United States where they say, you know, federal government has a right to regulate rivers and things like that are flowing across state lines. Right. And what they did was they, they narrowed the definition of what's the water in the United States. It has to be like the river, and everything out to the side can be drained now, according to that interpretation. Mm -hmm. And you know, especially in Florida where it's all groundwater, it's flowing. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's a <laughs> terrible ruling. In so Paul, doesn't that pretty much remove protect the overland connection rule? Doesn't that eliminate protection for all those prairie potholes? Yeah, yeah. All of them. Pretty much. Yeah. And and actually most of the wetlands in Florida. And you know, we're spending billions of dollars to try to build these big ugly reservoirs to store water because we're draining all our wetlands. Yeah. And we're not, you know, if we valued wetlands more, we wouldn't have to build such big reservoirs. But so this is and that's you know, this is a recent ruling. We'll see what we can do. Now let's go back to Ding Darling again real quick. And this is one of the things he wrote. Of course, you understand that I'm not nearly so much interested in the reservation of migratory waterfowl as I am in the management of water resources and the crucial effects of such management upon human sustenance. And of course, Ding, he retired now to mid Sands on Island and the refuge down there named after him. Wild ducks and geese and feeder ash shorebirds that are the only, only the delicate indicators of the prognosis for human existence, just as sure as God made little green animals. So, you know, 1953, he got it. Yeah, it's not that hard to know. What's so, t what's teeter asked? <laughs> uh, shorebird bob a lot. They, they flip around. And if you look at, <laughs> I think that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> He's swearing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but no, but that was his message. Is you know we're doing the ducks now for preserving water resources and it's for waterfowl, but it's for more than that. And you know, again, it's for us. You know, it's our water resources. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't heard me matter on too long, um, you can get on our website and after a one hour search, you'll be able to find our regular <laughs> <laughs> and, and our history of ornithology in the Oak Toby program. I don't have this one on the website yet. I've got, I don't think I have the kites and the grasshoppers on.